Hey, it's good to see you this morning. We're glad that you're here. If you're glad to be at church this morning, say amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to have a word of prayer. After we pray, you remain standing. We're going to worship the Lord together as we sing praises to his name. I want you to sing out, church. Today, maybe not so much this morning, but this afternoon or this evening, we'll have some newer songs. And even if you're not that familiar with it, you hear a verse, let's just open up and sing praises to the Lord. Boy, what a blessing it is to, 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 to be able to sing with the Lord and sing to the Lord. Let's do that this morning. Lord, I thank you for the chance to be at church now. I pray that you bless our time together. Lord, would you minister to us through your word? Lord, I pray that you'd be pleased as we, uh, as we open our hearts to you and we sing along with you, God. We want you to get the glory and honor. So, Lord, would you, would you be with us? Pray that you'd be pleased with all that goes on here and in the other building. Lord, meet with us today. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing. Amen. Come now found, page 507. We'll start on that first verse. Come now found. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy Second, here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger. Interposed his precious blood on the last. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a better, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. above oh for a thousand tongues oh for a thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise the glories of my god and king the triumphs of his grace my gracious master and my god assist me to the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. Can make the palace clean, his blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf and praise ye dumb, hear loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come and leave ye lame for joy. When peace like a
Thank you for the great singing. What an encouragement. Would you take your Bible and open to 1 Samuel chapter number 26 for our scripture reading this morning. 1 Samuel chapter number 26. We'll be finishing up this chapter, moving into chapter 27 tonight, Lord willing. Pastor asked me to bring you up to date slightly where we read last time. We read earlier that David was running from King Saul King Saul had a small army, about 3,000 men, trying to kill David. Last time this happened, we read that he was in a cave, David and all his men. And Saul left his troops and went up into the cave to cover his feet and rest a little bit. And David's men said, you got him trapped in the cave, let me kill him. And David said, no. He's the Lord's anointed, we're not going to do that. So he cut off a piece of his robe and when Saul got up and left the cave, David yelled down the mountain and said, I could have killed you. Here's a piece of your robe. And Saul apologized, basically, and had a change of heart and went home. But Saul didn't really have a change in heart. He came back again at a later date, where we read last time, with about 3,000 soldiers. And David heard of it. And they were camped in a field. And David and some men, one of them being Abishai, I went down and could see them camped out at night, all the tents. And in the middle of the night, Abishai, I am David, went down. And God had put a deep sleep on all those men. So David and Abishai walked right up on King Saul, which should never happen. Abner, the captain of the host, was laying right there, and he should have been protecting King Saul. King Saul lay in a trench, had a spear and a pitcher of water there. Abishai, I asked David to kill King Saul and David said, no, I'm not going to kill the Lord's anointed. So they took his spear and a pitcher of water and went on their way. And now they're calling back to these men at night, waking them up. If you look in 1 Samuel 26, we'll start in verse 13 to the end of the chapter. I did have to borrow Brother Bill's Bible this morning, so I'm not sure which version I'm reading out of. So bear with me. 
Then David went over to the other side and stood on top of a hill afar off, a great space being between them. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord hath stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea. Or as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and fetch it. And the Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into mine hand today. But I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord. And let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way. And Saul returned to his place. Lord, thank you for thy word. If you'll stand with me one more time, we'll take our songbooks, turn to page three, and sing Amazing Grace on that third page there. Amazing Grace. each other this morning.
Let's sing that third verse of Amazing Grace on that third verse. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures on that last through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far. Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Just a few broken pieces to work with. Just a handful of fragments of me. But Jesus picked them all up with his sweet hand of love. His vision was what I could be. He took what the world saw as worthless and created a masterpiece, made my mercy shaped in love, formed by the Father's hand, grace from our God above, nothing that I have done, no was made by mercy, saved by grace. No, I can't explain how he found me. I was hopelessly lost in my sin. But Jesus could see what tomorrow would bring and he did his work within with the scale of a potter he molded me in the image of him made by mercy It's only through amazing grace, oh, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind.
Those of you that don't know, know, that's Christy Rahelio. That's Brother Wayne and Miss Teresa's daughter. And uh, she's a traveling musician out of our church. Um, <laughs> no, she's fixing to move up there and be with, uh, be with Brother Alexander and Joanna and uh, be at their church. And boy, what a blessing. Amen. Well, 1 Samuel chapter number 29. 1 Samuel chapter 29. I don't know if that was the Holy Spirit or if she got a, got a hint as to what the message was today, but that line, made by mercy, what you see today was made by mercy is what she's saying. The message today is God's mercy in a mess of our own making. God's mercy in a mess of our own making. Uh, our story picks up in chapter number 28, uh, from chapter 28, verse number 2. And, and uh, as was mentioned this morning, David's been running from Saul for several years now, and, and in chapter 26 that we finished up reading uh, together this morning, as Brother Robert led us, that David had a chance to kill Saul again, but God spared him. I want you to look back at that verse that we read in chapter 26. Look back at verse number 23. This is what, this is what David was saying to Saul. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and faithfulness, for the Lord delivered thee into my hand, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. That's what David was saying. And then we skip a verse. And in chapter 27, verse number 1 that we'll read tonight, Lord willing, then David says, I'm going to perish by the hand of Saul. And so David runs. David runs and, and he winds up with Achish, the king of the Philistines. How did he get to that point? Well, uh, this is not the entire message, but I think it's good for us to understand. You know, our decisions come about because of stinking thinking. Because of stinking thinking. You know, I don't know what it was that got in David's mind. Uh, you know, he, he's been running for three years. He's been hiding out in caves. He's been living off the land. Not at home at night. Difficult time. He with 600 of his soldiers and all their family. And, uh, you know, he goes, from a, he goes from faith, believing that God's going to deliver him. And then two verses later, he's full of fear. I can't imagine. What, no. I can't imagine. You know, we can really rip on David about that, can't we? But haven't we all been there? I mean, I get up and get excited by the time I get to church on Sunday morning and I'm ready and I'm, 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 I'm ready for church and I, I'm ready to see you folks and I'm thankful for what God's given us in his word. Go home on Sunday night and by Monday morning sometimes the devil's just jumped all over me and I say, oh, what's the use? What's the use? Wake up Monday morning, you know, go uh, Sunday morning like David. Sunday morning, Sunday night. And boy, we're full of faith. Monday morning, we're full of fear. And that's even before I looked at the offering report, y'all. <laughs> I mean, David's had enough. <laughs> he said, I'm done, Batman. I'm done. That's a little private story there. I'm done. <laughs> Look, I'm not justifying what David did, but we've all been there. We've all been there. Difficulty, difficulty, difficulty wouldn't go away. I mean, we, man, I'm having difficulty, so I'm going to get busy. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do more at church, and it doesn't go away. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to fast and pray. Problem doesn't go away. I know, I'm going to read my Bible more. Problem doesn't go away. I'm going to have that hard talk with that person. We have the talk, but problem doesn't end, you know. I think that's kind of where David was. I mean, he is, he's struggled for years now. He figures he's got it figured out. Well, if I can't beat Saul, I'll just join the enemy. He's, he's using his own reasoning, and sometimes we do that. We, we, we come up with our own plan rather than following scriptural principles. 
So he winds up in Ziklag. Achish gives him Ziklag. Hey, by the way, it looks like it's working for him at the beginning. For 16 months, things are going well for David. Saul's not chasing him anymore. He's living in a town. They get to, you know, sleeping in the same bed every night for 16 months, going out and, and killing the enemy. Now, David's enemy was not who Achish thought it was. Achish thought the enemy was Israel because that was Achish's enemy. And David just told him, I'm killing the enemy. Achish thinks David's on his side. David's killing the Amalekites. And we can debate whether or not that was really what God wanted him to do. But nonetheless, here's, here's the problem. They get together, Achish and the men of the, the lords of the Philistines, they get together and they're coming after Israel. And Achish says, come on, David, you guys have won a lot of victories. Come on, you're going to help us again. David says, all right. That's where we pick up the story. Look in chapter 29. Verse number one says, Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek. The Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Jezreel, and the lords of the Philistines passed on by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his men passed on in the re-reward with Achish. And so they're, they're having this military, kind of a military <laughs> procession, and the lords of the Philistines are looking at all their men and sizing them up as to whether or not they're going to be successful, I guess, against the Israelites. And at the re-reward, at the end of the line, here comes David and his 600 men. Verse 3, and then the princess of the Philistines, then said the princess of the Philistines, what do these Hebrews here? And Achish said unto the princess of the Philistines, is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days or these years? And I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me this day. The princes of the Philistines were wroth with him. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him. And let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he reconcile himself to his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying, Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands? The lords of the Philistines get together and says, we're not having this guy go. They remembered back a few chapters ago in chapter 14. They remembered they'd gone out to fight against the Israelites. And some of the Israelites were with them. And, and in the middle of the battle, those Israelites turned against the Philistines. And, and they lost. And he remembers back in chapter 17 when David goes out against Goliath. And he slays Goliath. And then after that, they chase the Philistine armies. And the, and the, and the, and the ladies make the song there that David has slain 10,000. Saul slain thousands. David is 10,000. They made a song out of it. It must have been a pretty popular song because these folks knew about it. And they said, we're not having that happen again. We are not going to have that happen again. They're not going to make up a song about us. So Achish has to tell David, well, you got to go. Look at verse number 6. Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely as the Lord liveth, as thou hast been upright, thy going out and thy coming in with me, the host is good in my sight, for I have not found evil in, thy, in my sight. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me this day. Nevertheless, the Lord has favored thee not. Wherefore now return and go in peace, that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. <laughs> And then David, this, is, this always gets me, <laughs> did David, David kind of pushes the envelope right here. I mean, God in his mercy is sparing David, not from the Philistines. God is sparing David from David. And then, he, then, then David pipes up. I guess he knows now that God's in on this and it's not going to happen. And look what David says. And David said unto Achish, but what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servants so long as I've been with thee unto this day that I may not go fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Then Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God, notwithstanding the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to battle. Wherefore now rise up early in the morning with thy master servant that are come up with thee. And as soon as you be up early in the morning and have light, depart. Get out of here. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. I mean, think about this. David goes from having faith in chapter 26 to being fearful in chapter 27. Then we have that little gap there in chapter 28 where God tells us the story of Saul. And now he picks up with this story. 
And, uh, you know, during that 16 months, David is killing the Amalekites and he's, he's lying to, uh, he, he's being deceitful to Achish about who he's killing. And now he's fixing to go to battle against the Israelites. You know, he's almost forced into battle. And I don't know what his plan was. Maybe David's plan was to turn against the Philistines in that battle. I don't know. But if he'd gone to battle, think about this. If he'd gone to battle and maybe just kind of stayed in the back and not done anything, you know, he's in the battle against Saul. And maybe he would have been the one to kill Saul. And no doubt his men would have killed some of the Israelites. And then David's supposed to be king? And David knew he was to be king? I mean, there is no way that the Israelites would allow David to be king if David had gone out to battle and slain some of their husbands and sons and maybe even been in on the defeat of Saul, the murder of Saul or the, the killing of Saul in the battle. I mean, David's got himself into that mess, but by the end of chapter 29, David's walking out smelling like a rose. I mean, hey... It's good. He's going back home, going back home to Ziklag, and he doesn't have to fight against those folks. How did that happen? How did David, I mean, was it because of David's uh, debonair personality? Was it because of his acting ability? Was it because of, but because of his charm? No, it wasn't anything to do with David. It had everything to do with the mercy of God. God's mercy in the mess of our own making. God's mercy in our own mess. Lord, would you bless your word? Thank you for the story. Help us to learn from it to this morning. God, I pray if there's one here today that's not, that doesn't know you as Savior, as Christy saying, Lord, I thank you that your mercy on our life to spare us to this point, to give us a point where we can accept your grace by faith. Lord, would you work in our hearts and lives today in Jesus' name. Amen. This whole, this whole chapter here, when we read that, there wasn't any mention of God by David. In fact, David didn't even pray and say, oh God, you got to get me out of this mess. I have really messed up. Lord, please get me out of this mess. David didn't pray. The only mention of God in that chapter is when Achish makes a mention of God, and Achish wasn't even a believer. But God, in his mercy... Spared David again, just like he did against the lion and the bear. Just like he did against Goliath. Just like he did against Saul. God's taking care of David. It's a little bit different this time, though, because in the other instances, well, this time, the problem is because of David. It's because of David. It's a mess of his own making. And he doesn't even pray for God's mercy. He doesn't even ask for God's help. But God comes down and rescues him. And it's interesting. He uses the Philistine lords to do it. He uses the enemies of God's people to make the decision to force David to do what God wants him to do. God, in his mercy, saw David heading down a path that he didn't need to be on. In a, race, in a race, the analogy from a couple of weeks ago, in a race that he didn't need to be in, he's in the wrong race, and God stepped in to stop David from ruining himself. Listen to what this commentator from years ago said. How often, alas, do we make it necessary that we should be rescued from our own path of unbelief by the manifest providence of God rather than by the energy of a faith which turns to him. We cannot censure David as though he were, we were innocent, but seek to learn from the lesson which God has given us here that all such departure from God is a grievous dishonor to his name. And if we're spared from the outward consequences of our own belief, it's not because of any faithfulness on our part, but because of him whose mercy endureth forever. God's mercy when we don't ask for it. God's mercy when we don't pray. God's mercy when we're not very faithful. But he's always faithful and he's always merciful. Church, I believe that's why these 11 verses, that's why that story's in there. 
it's a neat little story, and God's taking care of David, but it's for you and I. Our lack of faith, we start going down paths that we ought not go down. But God's still there. And often he rescues us. You know, if I were God, a lot of times, I think with my attitude sometimes, if I were God, I wouldn't rescue you. And if you were God, you probably wouldn't rescue me, you know. Hey, you made your bed, now you got to lay in it. But God gives deliverance in our messes, messes that we make. You ever been in a mess of your own making? Hey, we don't have time for everybody's testimony, y'all. Okay, don't raise your hand. We don't have time for all that. You're headed down the wrong road. God steps in. You know, it, it, we, we may not get it until we get to heaven. We may not understand it until we get to heaven. And the Lord says, look what I did here. I spared you from this. I spared you from this. It's like a chess game maybe. I don't know if that's a good analogy or not. But, you know, the Lord, uh, we take a move and the Lord says, I'm going to block that. I'm going to block that. I'm going to go here. going to stop that. Parents, we've got examples of that with our children, don't we? You, know, you step in. They didn't ask you to step in. But you step in and stop them from doing something really, really dangerous, really, I mean, it could have lifelong consequences, and you stop, step in and say, uh-uh, not going to do it. They didn't ask, but you step in. <laughs> I've told you this before, but years ago when we were living in Texas, I don't even know if we were even on church staff yet. It's been that long ago. We were over at Miss Cheryl Guffey's parents' house, which is... My wife's brothers, okay, Jerry. Some of you remember Jerry and Rita. So we were there, and on their back porch, which is a closed-in porch, Stacy was a little, I don't think Stacy was out of diapers yet. I don't even know if she was walking yet, but uh, we were there, and we, I don't even know why we were there. But uh, we looked around, and Stacy was walking to the back porch there or crawling to the back porch, I don't remember, and it was one of those big old slugs, you know, like a, like a like a snail on steroids, just a big slug. And she was there, and she grabbed that thing. And it was coming to her mouth. <laughs> and mama has a fit, slaps her hand. She cries. She doesn't know. I'm standing there saying, hey, you, but you made the mess. You get yourself. I mean, you're not going to like that. You know? No, I did not say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. But, you know, sometimes that's what God does to us. We don't understand why. We don't know what the consequences are going to be. And he steps in in his mercy, slaps our hands. Uh-uh. You're not doing that. Again, sometimes I would say, well, look, you, you, you got yourself in a mess. You get yourself out of it. God's not that way. God's not that way. Young people, let me talk to you a few minutes here now. <laughs> you know, um, when you get in high school, you think, oh, that, hey, Valentine's coming up. This fits perfect. You get in high school and you think, oh, man, i got to have a girlfriend. You know, kid's 13, 14 years old. i got to have a boyfriend. i got to have a girlfriend, you know. Do you like me? And you put it on their, in their locker, yes or no, or put it on their desk. I didn't do that, but I did get one of those notes, seventh grade. My wife doesn't know this story, so. Uh, <laughs> on my desk, do you love me, yes or no? <laughs> it was Debbie Wall. Who? Do you remember her? Okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, if you're 14 or 15, you're not ready to get married, so, you know, you've got to watch out for that kind of stuff. Uh, hey, when it's time for you to begin looking for a, a wife or a husband, okay. But just because it's Valentine's on February 14th doesn't mean that, oh, I've got to have a girlfriend. I've got to have a boyfriend. 
And then sometimes God says, nope. Now, what do you do? I mean, we go to school. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to that story with Debbie. <laughs> and, and everything was good. Seventh and eighth grade year. Woo-hoo. Freshman year in high school. I have a new boyfriend. Crushed me. Because her new boyfriend was my best friend. <laughs> Larry, Larry Francisco. That made it even worse. Can we still be friends? Yeah, sure. But I think about, I think about that. And I think about all those other girls that were writing me notes and stuff. <laughs> that did not happen. That did not happen. But I think, I think back, and one time we went, we went back home, and Debbie didn't wind up marrying Larry anyway. She married another guy in our class. But I think back, and, and I think, what if? Where would I be now? What about this one, or what about that one? Or what if God allowed that to develop before I met the girl that he wanted me to marry? Uh Uh-uh. I didn't ask for it. In fact, I was disappointed. In fact, I was heartbroken. You know, but God knew. Mercy in a mess of our own making. God's, God's mercy. Maybe for you it's a career decision. Man, everything, this job, you get this job offer, you think it's a great job offer, and Man, you're, you're finally getting paid what you think you're worth, and you're finally getting the recognition, and you're getting out of the bad environment at the job that you're at, and, and now you're gonna, it's going to be great, and you're already thinking about, I'm going to upgrade my vehicle, and I'm going to upgrade my house, and this is going to be wonderful. And then the job opportunity just dissipates, and it just disappears, and they don't call you back, and they pretty much told you that you were going to get the job, but now... And you contact them, and they say, well, you know, we got to go a different direction. You know, the reports weren't as good as we thought it was going to be. We can't hire you right now. Could it be that God saw something down the road? Said, I don't want you in that environment. I don't want you in that business. I don't want you with that company. I don't want you around those, 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 those people. You know, pardon the personal illustrations today. I really tried to look for some others so it wouldn't be so personal. I, I looked for hours, and I couldn't find any stories that I thought would fit. But I know this. When, whenever I was, uh, really, I wasn't even thinking about getting into church ministry all that much. I've told you the story. I'm, I'm going to be a school teacher, and I'm going to teach music classes and maybe, a, maybe a, a, a math class. And I thought, man, that'd be great. You have to do music all day. You have a guy's choir. You have a girl's choir. You have a, 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 a chorale. And then you have the good choir. And then a, and then a good ensemble. And, and then maybe a math class to fill it in if I need to. And, and you work nine months and have the three months off and do what? And, you know, I'm thinking, like that boy, you know, 20 years I can retire. 30 years I can retire with full salary. I said, that's a great job to me. So that's what I was planning. I was planning and... and uh, Opportunity came for me to go lead singing at a Southern Baptist church not far from the house. And you know, the reason I was, <laughs> the reason I, 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 I questioned, I didn't know if I had a vehicle that would make it 40 miles on the highway. You know, we, we, were, we were poor. And uh, you know, I'm co- in college and my wife's trying to work my way through college for me and, and I'm working as much as I can, but you know, I, but God shut that door. God shut that door. I wonder what would have happened if I'd have gone up to Temple, Oklahoma and started working with the Southern Baptists and working with these folks and getting to know some of those folks. I mean, in Oklahoma, you know, your name's Bartlett and you're in music in the Southern Baptist Convention. You are somebody because Uncle Gene was a big, big wig with music in, in Oklahoma. And you wonder, God's shutting the door. God's shutting the door. You're going through a time of discontent in your marriage, 
in your church, in your job, and you think you got something else on the back burner. I think this will work. Listen. Every one of us that have been here for any amount of time, every one of us that have been here for any amount of time, we've had a good reason, according to man's reason, to leave this place. But I think back, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking 20, 30 years ago. I think back on those days, I think, what if, when I was getting a little discontented, with what I was doing and with all that I was doing and I'm not getting recognized for it and I'm not getting the pats on the back. If you knew Brother Buchanan, he didn't do that a whole lot. And I don't either, Brother DJ, I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> but I think back, what if I had just picked up and left because I got been out of shape over something? Church would have gone on, y'all would have been fine, but I would not be right here, and I am so thankful that God put me in the ministry. I am so thankful. Never knew what a blessing it would be to, to be called a pastor. What would we have missed out on? Number one, you would have missed out on the, on the best pastor's wife that I think you could ever have. Does that make up for Sunday school? <laughs> I almost cried, y'all. At least I tried. So what do we do? Go to Psalm 118. What do we do? Psalm 118. You know, when we, when we realize, listen, when we realize that God in his mercy will act on our behalf, whether we ask him or not, and and when we, when, we, when we realize that, look at Psalm 118. Look at verse number 1. Psalm, that's 119. Psalm 118, look at verse number 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Read it with me. Because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his, read it with me, his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say together that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say together that his mercy endureth forever. Did you know God's mercy was alive before this world was created? <laughs> God's mercy was alive before Adam and Eve were created. God's mercy endures forever. And it will endure for you. And God's mercy will keep you out of some places you ought not go. However, listen. I'm not discounting what we preached last week. There comes a Romans 1 time when God finally says, enough is enough. There comes a Proverbs 29 1 time when, okay, you've hardened your neck, enough. There's no remedy now. There, there does come that time. But can I tell you folks that are listening online and you folks that are right here, if you're at church today, that time hadn't come. Because if that time ever comes, you won't have any conviction. You won't be in church. You won't get mad at church people. You just won't give a rip. So that time hadn't come for any of you folks here or any of you, any of you folks watching online. But listen, it, it, it takes a long time to outrun God's mercy. It takes a long time. So what should we do? Worship him for his mercy. Praise him for his mercy. Tonight when we come together and we sing together, and that's not the only time you get to worship. You can worship on your own. Uh, this morning before Sunday school started, and uh, we have the we have the the the, the rock music station going. No, 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 no. We have a uh, we have uh, faith music missions going in the Sunday school class, and they were playing a song, and they were just playing a song, and it was time to start Sunday school. But I'm listening to that song, and I couldn't stop it because I'm listening to the goodness of God, the goodness of God, the goodness of God. I'm thinking, yes, Lord, that's me, that's me. Thank you, thank you, Lord. I was just having a little a little time, just a little quiet time. Standing at the platform, standing at the podium, our folks are visiting and enjoying the company, enjoying the fellowship, and I'm thinking, thank you, Lord. Hey, you can do that this afternoon. When we come together tonight, let's worship him for his mercy. Number two, number two, welcome his mercy. 
Worship him for his mercy. Number two, welcome his mercy. This morning, I think you ought to tell God, God, anytime you see a problem in my life, I want you to step in and stop it. You may not understand it. In fact, it may be disappointing to you. But you give God, you give God the prerogative he already has, but you just tell him, God, I am welcoming your mercy. Sometimes he's telling you, not now. Sometimes he's telling you, slow down. Sometimes he's telling you, don't buy that. Sometimes he's telling you, don't take that job. God's showing you his mercy. It might be through a sermon like this morning. It might be through a song. It, it, it might be through a friend. It might be through a parent. Young people, listen to me. It might be through a parent. And for all of us, don't get bitter. Don't get mad. Don't get mad at God when in his mercy he stops you from doing something. Some of you young folks, you think that your parents are just, I mean, all their, you just think that their whole life, you just think that all that they do when they go in their bedroom is, is figure out a way to make you miserable. <laughs> That's the parent's goal is to make you miserable. Some of you are feeling that way. <laughs> well, now, how do you know? I was a teenager a few years ago. But listen, if you will see your parents as agents of God's mercy, if you will see your parents, if you will see your youth pastor as agents of God's mercy, you won't get mad when they try to step in and say, hey, you know, I think maybe you need to change this, go a different direction. When your parents step in, you say, well, brother, I'll... <laughs> yeah, hey, come spend a day with my parents and you won't be saying that. Come spend a day at my house and you won't be saying that. Okay, you got this story? You remember the story? God showed mercy to David. Who did he use? Who did God use to keep David out of trouble? He used the Philistines. He used the Philistine lords. He used the enemy of God's people, which would be the enemies of God. He used them, the murderers. I don't know that your parents have murdered anybody. Lately, maybe they thought about you, but they haven't done it yet. If God can deliver somebody from a mess through a wicked Philistine, what makes you think that he can't spare you from a mess using an imperfect parent? And listen, I've, I was a parent for a long time. And I didn't make very good grades as being a parent. And by the way, if God tells you it's coming and you get married and you have children, then uh, you're going to find out. It's, a, it's difficult. It's not easy to be a parent. It's a lot easier to be a grandparent, but that's another story. Listen, if you will view your parents as an agent of God's grace, God's mercy, God is stepping in and telling you, nope, you're not going there. Nope, you're not going with that friend. Nope, you're not doing that. If your parents didn't care... They just say, go ahead, get drunk. Go ahead, do dope. Go ahead, be a harmonger. Go ahead, I don't give a rip. But your parents care, and they're trying to stop you from ruining your life. Hey, if you're in a mess right now, let's wind it up. If you're in a mess right now, maybe, maybe, maybe a mess of your own making in your marriage. Maybe a mess of your own making with your parents in your relationship with your parents. Maybe a mess of your own making in a relationship with your child. Maybe a mess of your own making in a relationship with the brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. Maybe you're in a mess of your own making through your finances. You've been, you've been a bad steward. You've, you've, you've wasted money. You've got bad spending habits. Maybe you're in a mess of your own making. Hey, the Bible says God's mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You're here today. God wants to help you. He is slow to anger. He is rich in mercy. We read the verses. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy never runs out. He will always, as we preached last week, he will always hear the humble prayer 
of repentance and say, God, forgive me, God. I thank you for your mercy. I've been upset. I've been mad over this situation, that situation that you didn't allow in my life. And I still don't understand it, God, but I know it's your mercy. And I'm giving you authority. I'm I'm telling you, God, I'm going to be on your side. And I'm not going to get upset. And I'm not going to get bitter. I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. Now, for some of you, the mercy that you need right now, today, you need God's mercy on your never-dying soul. You You need to step out by faith. I read this last week. I thought it was good. This will be the last thing, maybe. A bunch of folks in a boat. A bunch of folks in a big boat. And something happens, and the boat sinks. And folks are out there, and they're trying to get in the, they're trying to get in the life raft. And, and some folks are there, and they don't even know that there is a life raft, and they wind up drying, drowning. They don't even know. Other folks know there's a life raft, and they believe that that's a life raft, and they believe that that, ra- that life raft will save them. They believe it, and they know it, but they don't go get on the boat, and they drown. And then there's other folks. They know it. They believe that that raft can save them, and they get to it, and they get in. They have faith, and they get in, and they're saved. It's not, listen, it's not, it's not their faith necessarily that saves them. It's the boat. It's the boat. It's not, well, do I have enough faith? Can I believe God? It's Jesus Christ. Amen. Salvation is him. It's not us. Amen. Well, I don't know if I have enough faith. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know. It's not us. It's Jesus Christ. Some of you need to make that decision this morning. Let's stand together. Heads about eyes closed. I'm going to pray. After I pray, Miss Donna's going to begin to play a song. As soon as she begins to play, I want you to do business with the Lord. Some of us need to hit the altar. Some of us need to be saved. Some of us need to confess to the Lord. Lord, I've been bitter. I see it now as your mercy. Thank you, God. Lord, would you, bl- would you bless the message? Lord, thank you for da- David's example. And Lord, even though he wasn't right in the situation and he didn't even ask you, Lord, it's so, so, so good for us that we, we can see a man after your own heart has some of the same attitudes and same problems that, you, that we have. And God, I just pray that you'd help us to accept that. Now, Lord, for that one that's lost today, for those that are closest to hell, I pray that you'd save them today. I pray that you give them courage to step out, trust you as Savior. We'll thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. You do business with the Lord, Miss Donna Place. Right there, are you you talking to the Lord? God, thank you. Thank you for for saving me from myself. God, thank you for keeping me from making some wrong career decisions, some wrong relationship decisions. And I wasn't happy about it at the time, but I'm thanking you for it now. Thank you for your mercy. Young folks, you need to be thankful for your your parents, for your teachers, for your school principal, for your youth pastor, for your pastor. You need to be thankful that folks are warning you and trying to keep you. That Sunday school teacher, that bus worker. Thank you that folks are trying to step in and show God's mercy. Be an agent of God's mercy. Be thankful for that. Sing with me now. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. All right, you can look this way. Just a couple of quick announcements. Ladies, there's a ladies' fellowship this Tuesday night.
February 7th at 6.30. Sign-up sheet on the back table. See my wife if you have any questions. This Friday, February the 10th, is Parents' Night Out from 5 to 8 o'clock. We are taking care of the children. We don't do pets, y'all, so uh, you got to keep your pets at home. We're not doing pets. <laughs> <laughs> on Saturday, February 11th, men's breakfast at 8.30. Men, you got to get signed up for that so that we'll make sure that we have enough food for everybody. Then on the 18th, we have a work day. Please get signed up for that as well so that we'll make sure that we have enough materials and enough things to, for everyone to be able to work for a couple of hours. We'll go from, we'll go from 9 o'clock, get organized, and then, you know, until, uh, until you get done. What I don't want to do is start a bunch of projects and then me and Brother DJ have to finish them before, before Monday night. So I want you to get, you know, just to, but we're not planning on working all day just a just a few hours if you can help us out that would be a blessing unless you're a slow worker uh, then I would hope that you would stay and finish the job that you're given to do then the Mardi Gras conference February 20th and 21st brother Gibbs and brother Cecil Ballard and uh, then hey one other announcement uh, please uh, church family and I know you like to talk to folks uh, once it's getting right about time for church to start please don't talk to the men in the sound booth especially during the song service because they're trying to do this, that, and the other, and sometimes they're not able to switch the songs fast enough because somebody's back there talking to them, and they're trying to do three things, four things at once. So I'd appreciate you just leaving them alone, especially once the service begins. Same thing before the service with the ladies that are playing the piano. I know everybody likes to visit and talk, but, you know, we want to get the, we want to get the pregame music started so that, uh, so that uh, that's what the, the what's that called, the prelude? The prelude. I just call it the pregame music. We'll just, you know, we just want to get, get things going. So uh, please, please help us out with that. Amen. Well, thank you for being here this morning. Let's sing together. What are we singing this morning, brother? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's sing together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he Life is worth 